super passionate about this um, topic and making sure that patients here at CTCA and throughout the enterprise um, really know what CRCI is and um, how that kind of can impact them and what they can do about it. Um, so first, let's just talk about cancer-related cognitive impairment or CRCI, which you probably have heard of as chemo brain. So um, what is CRCI? It, patients ask me all the time, like, when does it go away? We're going to kind of talk about all of that. So first, um, what CRCI is a side effect of treatment. It's plain and simple as that. So this is just like losing your hair or gaining weight and losing weight are all side effects of treatment. Dry mouth can be a side effect of treatment. Cognitive impairment can be a side effect of cancer treatment. Okay. And so this cognitive impairment may look different if I had 10 of you lined up who are having these symptoms not everyone's symptoms are going to look the same. We're going to talk today about the three main symptoms that they have found during research um, and give you kind of some tips on how to improve the symptoms you may be experiencing. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start off about the fact about busting the myth of chemo brain. I have a lot of patients who come to me because they've had noticed cognitive changes and they're like, hold on, I never actually had a drop of chemo how can I have this? I don't think I can have chemo brain. I've heard about chemo brain, but I don't think that's something I have personally because I've never had chemo. And what I explained to them is it doesn't have to be just the chemo. They've also found that a lot of the hormone treatments, so um, the hormone therapies that breast cancer patients have to do, as well as prostate cancer patients and some other hormone treatments that sometimes are completed during cancer treatment can have an impact on your cognition. So um, we'll go ahead and that's why they came up with this more broad version. And the version I like to use in terms of the term is cancer related cognitive impairment because it lets everyone know um, it's more inclusive. You don't have to have had chemo to have these cognitive side effects. So when I started here eight years ago, um, CRCI, the term actually didn't exist yet. And we were just talking about mild cognitive impairments during treatments. That's kind of how the medical community was referring to it. And honestly, not all physicians were on board that this actually existed. And so um, when I came here eight years ago, it was kind of spotty with the research and it was kind of getting everybody on board to realize, OK, yeah, this is a side effect. I would say in the last five years, the research in the area of CRCI had grown tremendously. Um, if you go on the Web and, you know, you know, like Google Scholar, you're going to find that there's many many articles now looking at cancer related cognitive impairment, looking at the different cancer types that are more likely to have it or seem to have it more, or the types of chemos that patients can be on that seem to have more cognitive difficulties. So lots of research in that area that if you're interested in, you can find more information now. Um, so we're going to talk about the three top symptoms of CRCI. And so that, that way, you know, you know, am I experiencing CRCI? Is this what this is? So the first symptom is short-term memory impairment. So this is, I know that I have a doctor's appointment next Tuesday at four o'clock. I know this. I have put this on my calendar at home. I've talked to my spouse about this appointment on Tuesday at 4 p.m. And then suddenly Tuesday at lunch, I think, oh, I need to clean out the garage and I get going on the garage. And then Tuesday evening, your spouse rolls in from work and was like, oh, how was that daughter's appointment? You're like, daughter's appointment? Oh, I did have a daughter's appointment. So you find that you're for getting more appointments that you normally would not have. You might find with the short-term memory impairment that you're no longer able to manage your medications as well as you used to. I had a patient who was in here this past week who was like, Jennifer, I'm taking, like I have my medications and I have them in appropriate spots so I can see them, but I'm still getting, I'll get mixed up and take my nighttime meds in the morning or take my morning meds at night. So that's another example of a short-term memory impairment. It also could be that you're having a, you've had a conversation with your loved one, a child, a spouse, an in-depth conversation about something. And then the next day you're like, oh, I thought we talked about that, but I can't really remember the details of it. And your family member might be like, what do you mean you don't remember the details of this? We talked about it in great length. And you think, why can't I remember this? But I just can't. That's also a good example of short-term memory impairments. Um, having trouble with money management, bill management is what I really see a lot of with CRCI. So people who have always managed their bills, always pay their bills on time. And then suddenly they start to forget to pay their bills, not because they don't have the money, but because they literally forgot that they didn't pay the bill. 
Um, I always ask patients who come to see me on a one-to-one -one setting. I say, oh, what brought you here? And I had this gentleman show up a few years ago and he said, oh, well, I, I said, you know, why are you here? And he goes, it all started um, with the Comcast bill. And I was like, okay, can you explain? And he was like, sure. You know, I've been keeping our bills for 46 years, my wife, and I, I have a spreadsheet. I check off every month when I've paid my bills. This has worked for 46 solid years. He goes, the other day, my wife comes running up from the basement because she works for Amazon and was like, oh my gosh, the internet's out. I'm in the middle of my shift. And he goes, I was so infuriated. And I thought there's nothing wrong. It's sunny outside. I'm calling Comcast. We're going to get half a month free. So he picks up the phone. He calls Comcast and he's like, you know, what's going on? The internet just went out. Like we're going to need some reimbursement for this. My wife's in the middle of her shift with Amazon. And the Comcast um, representative said, sir, you haven't paid your bill in three months. We just turned you off. And he was mortified because in his mind, he had paid the bill. And in fact, for the past three months on his spreadsheet, he had checked that he had paid the bill. And so he immediately whipped out a credit card. He said, here's my number, you know, please go ahead and back bill me. You need to turn on the internet today. And if my wife calls, you know, this is because an outage. Don't dare tell her I didn't pay the bill. And so he said, so I came to my doctor's appointment and I said, something is wrong with me to my medical oncologist and he said, okay, are you noticing other issues? And he was like, yeah, I'm not remembering things as well, but I thought it was because I was getting older, but I have never forgotten a bill. And so that's what brought him to my office. So that's a great example of short-term memory impairments. Um, all of those, maybe you're misplacing your personal items. I find that patients will state like they have always not been great with their keys, but suddenly it's like a daily occurrence where you can't find your keys. Or I had a patient who was forgetting his lunch every day I was driving his wife insane because she was having to drive his lunch across town to him at work. So these could be all be examples of short-term memory. And you're going to see that these are things that you might have done pre-cancer, but instead of doing it like once every two to three weeks or once every other month, suddenly you're doing it multiple times a week and the frequency of these errors are more often. Okay. So the first symptom of CRCI is the short-term memory deficit. The second symptom you may be experiencing is word finding difficulty. You know what you want to say, okay? You're like, I know what I want to say. And it can be easy too. We're not talking like a difficult word or a word you don't use very often. It could be as easy as the word pen. And you're like, pass me the, and you see it. You might actually even physically see it on the desk. And you're like, I see it. I know it writes. I know it has ink, but the word pen just leaves you, okay? Or you're in the middle of a conversation and you've got this train of thought going, like you are ready. You know exactly what you want to say. You know where you're going with this train of thought. And then you get halfway in the sentence and you're like, it's gone. Like it is completely and utterly gone. Okay. Or it could be um, the word recall for like names. So you might have known this woman for 25 years. She might sit on the front row of your church. You might could describe multiple things about her, about her family, what she does for her career, like know lots and lots of information about her. And yet when it gets time, you see her walking towards you and you think, oh my gosh, I cannot remember her name. Okay. So word finding is one that I find that many, many patients with CRCI um, report that they have difficulty with. And it seems to be the symptom that drives people the most crazy because I had a woman in here this week who's young. She's in her early forties. And she was like, Jennifer, at my job, I feel incompetent, not because I don't know what to do, but I have a hard time expressing myself now. And so the people around me, I feel like are looking at me like, get it out. Go ahead and tell me, what, you know, what do you need to say? And she goes, I feel like it's so much harder for me to express myself than it was prior to treatment. So that's the second side effect. So we've got short-term memory impairment. We have word finding difficulty. And the third one is multitasking issues. So you may find that you no longer can multitask, which is um, a big issue in 2021 where basically every job in America requires you to multitask or simple things that used to be simple for you, such as cooking, can be a place where you're finding more difficulty. I find that cooking is an activity that requires lots of multitasking. We don't think about it. We just do it. We get the pots and pans out. We get all the, you know ingredients out, we mix it up. But what I find is when my patients with CRCI will say, you know, I've always been an amazing cook or I've always loved to bake and now I'm forgetting key ingredients. I can even be looking at the recipe and get so sidetracked by this portion 
of what I need to do that I forget to go back and add this. So multitasking becomes an issue um, with patients with CRCI. So it may not just, it may not be cooking. It could be at work, like you're in the middle of an email, somebody comes in, they interrupt you, like you're typing the email. You get going on this other thing and you may forget that you even started the email till the end of the day and it's still sitting there or until the next day you're like, hold on, did I send that email? Did I do that? And so you might find that you're more easily distracted. Um, I also find that patients often will report that they start a lot of projects at home, but they don't complete them. So like, because they get distracted and they can't multitask. So they may be like, oh, okay, I'm going to clean the bathroom. But while they're in the bathroom, they think, oh, you know what? I didn't pay that water bill. Let me go write the check and pay the water bill. Pay the check. Oh, well, I'm here. Oh, see, this kitchen needs to be clean. Let me start that. Oh, you know what? It's two o'clock. I need to go. And you get back and you're like, oh, well, my bathroom did get finished and my kitchen's halfway completed. I did get the water bill out though. And so you just find a lot of projects are left undone. Um, I had a patient who brought her husband in because she was a type A personality, always had been her entire life. Like their house was always organized to a T. Everything was just so. She would get aggravated with him if he put things out of place. And then during treatment, things changed dramatically. Like he came and was like, you know, our closet is on the bed when I get home. And I'm like, why is all our closet in our bedroom? And she's like, oh, I thought I would reorganize that. But then I needed to go do stuff in the kitchen. And he was like, it's like projects never get finished. They all get started, but they never get finished. And so we had to talk a lot about the multitasking difficulties that come with CRCI. And so it's like staying on task is much more difficult. And then even when you get off task, which happens to all of us, it's really hard to get back to the original task and then complete it. So those seem to be the, and research shows when you look up the research, the three top symptoms of cancer-related cognitive impairment seem to be this short-term memory loss, this word-finding difficulty, and multitasking issues. Um, you know, at the very beginning, Leslie mentioned that they're saying up to one-third the research even more recently has come out. When I started eight years ago, they were saying anywhere from 30% to 70% of cancer patients may have CRCI, cancer-related cognitive impairment. I thought that's terrible data. 30% to 70% is a huge data range. They kind of, more recent articles I've written, narrowed that down to 50 to 70% of patients um, who are going through cancer treatment may experience some level of CRCI. It could be very mild, it could be quite severe. Um, it varies from person to person. So, which I think is more accurate, the 50 to 70%. And honestly, it may be more. Patients don't like to discuss this with their physicians, with their families. Um, and when I ask patients about why, like, why didn't you tell your physician that you were having these memory issues? I get two common responses. The first is, oh, I was just so focused on treatment and everything else. I thought that this stuff would go away once I was done with treatment. So that's one common answer I get. And the second answer I get is, honestly, I couldn't handle one more thing being wrong. I couldn't report one more issue. I was so tired of going to my appointments and being like, I have this, I have this, I have this. And so I just didn't want to say one more thing is wrong. Um, the thing about CRCI and it being a side effect is it's not as easily identified by others. So when you are losing weight during treatment or gaining weight during treatment or losing hair, you know, or just overall felt nauseous, your physician could pick up on that, right? When you went into the office visit without you really having to say too much because you look that way. Like if you were nauseous, you look nauseous. You know, if you were losing weight, that's pretty evident based on the scale and, you know, maybe your clothes were hanging on you, off of you. The thing about cancer-related cognitive impairment is people don't see it. When you're going and sitting in an office, you may look like you. You know, you may not look any different than you did prior to cancer. And because of that, I feel like it's a misunderstood side effect. Um, my patients tell me often, you know, my family doesn't seem to understand that I cannot remember information the same way I used to. My family doesn't seem to understand why I can't find words. And they're like, it's because I don't look sick. I look like me. And so they just assume because I look like me, I think like me. And I think the patient that um, inspired me the most in my early years here at CTCA was a teacher. He's a history teacher. And he was like, Jennifer, I look no different than I did before I even had cancer. He goes, I haven't gained a pound. I haven't lost a pound. Didn't lose my hair. 
look just like me. He goes, and honestly, my energy level is not terrible, not great, but it's not terrible. He goes, I've continued to be able to work. He goes, but because I don't look any different, everybody thinks I'm the same. So when they see me walking down the halls, they stop me and they say, hey, we've got a meeting at three o'clock. See you there. And I'm like, did you email that to me? They're like, oh, no, no, just see you at three. And he goes, somebody else will stop me and go, oh, here's this piece of paper that you needed for this permission slip. He goes, I'll get stopped five times on my way to my classroom. He goes, and by the time I get to my classroom, honestly, I'll only remember the last person who stopped me and what they needed me to do. So I won't remember the other four. He goes, or I'll remember pieces of it, but not everything. He goes, and I've tried to tell my coworkers, hey, listen, I've got memory issues. I need you to email me. And they're all like, yeah, I'm getting old too. He's like, this isn't about age. I literally have memory issues from my treatment. He goes, and he goes, I think what it's most difficult for me is I feel like nobody understands where I'm coming from. He goes, I just feel so alone. And so when he told me that, and I was like, okay, I've got to figure out a way for people here at CTCA to be able to meet others who are dealing with similar circumstances, similar cognitive impairments, for you to be able to see that you're not alone. Okay. So we here in Atlanta do a monthly um, cancer related cognitive impairment support group so that you can meet. And then we love to do these enterprise wide Zoom calls so that, that way you can meet people from all the sites and all over who are dealing dealing with CRCI, because I think there's power in knowing that you're not alone and that this is, this can happen. This is not abnormal. This is, can be a side effect and part of treatment, but I also like to make sure that patients know that there's hope and there are things we can do to help with this. Okay, so before we get into questions, I kind of want to give you some overview or some things that we can do to help with this, because I think a lot of patients, in fact, I had one in my office this week who was like, oh my gosh, I really wish I'd known that there was someone who could help with this five weeks ago, six weeks ago, because I would have been here doing therapy every week if I had known that, you know, I need to go back to a job and I need to be able to perform highly at that job. And right now I'm a little worried about that. So um, the first thing I tell everybody is that we cannot substitute these groups or these webinars for you speaking with your physician. You really have to let your physician or your physician assistant or your nurse practitioner know that you're dealing with these side effects, okay? You need to talk to them about the cognitive difficulties you're experiencing. And there's a few reasons for that. Number one, they need to look at your lab levels. There truly, there could be something going on with your labs that could cause the cognitive side effects, okay? And so sometimes it's not just treatment, it's the fact that your lab levels are out of whack, which can really mess up your ability to think clearly, okay? Number two is they just need to be aware of what's going on. So if it's not lab levels and they say, well, this probably is related to your treatment, but we have to press on, they can consider whether or not you're appropriate for therapy um, with a therapist. Now, depending on what state you're in or where you are location-wise, both speech therapist and occupational therapist can deal with cognitive rehab. Um, here at CTCA Atlanta, our speech pathologists do that. Also in Chicago and Phoenix. So for all three sites of CTCA, the speech pathologists or speech therapists like myself are the ones who do the cognitive assessments. We do in-depth cognitive assessments. We see where your memory strengths are versus your memory weaknesses. And we come up with plans that are very individualized to you and your ability to remember information. And so that, that way you can handle day-to-day -day life maybe using different memory strategies than you've had to use in the past, okay? So, but there are other areas of the country, like I'm thinking out in Washington, Seattle, where occupational therapists are mainly the people who deal with cognitive difficulties. So um, don't be thrown off if you're like, go tell, talk to your physician. They're like, oh, I know this great occupational therapist who can do cognitive rehab. It could be both, okay? So it doesn't have to be just a speech pathologist who can do this just at CTCA, it is the speech therapist here who handle this and help come alongside you. So the idea of therapy is trying to come up with, okay, what are your difficulties and how can we manage it? But I also tell people that there are also some broad things that I can give you during these sessions that can assist you as well and what I have found, okay? So number one, what I've found in my eight and a half years of doing this is that verbal memory, so your ability to hear and remember, is usually most impacted with CRCI. So I've seen a few of you jotting notes, which I think is fantastic. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I see that. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Somebody's taking notes. 
So no, like your ability to see and remember is actually most often with CRCI much better than your ability to hear and remember, okay? Which can cause a problem with folks because for a lot of people, the deal is their auditory memory has always been a strength. You go, you hear people talk, you remember the information, you can continue on. What you might find now is you hear people talk and you're like, what did they say? That sounds like, eh. or you might remember for a little bit of time, but you can't carry it days on end like you could previously. So I'm really big on patients getting things that are visual in nature to help them remember. So visual calendars, like, and I'm talking the paper pencil, we're going old school here. <laughs> people are like, oh, I love to use my phones. And I'll have to say, I have a small percentage of patients that works for where they can use their phones, their phones can set off reminders and that works for them. But what I often find with our phones is we've become so um, overrun with the phone, you know, the phone ringing, the beeps of the text messages, the beeps of the alarms. It's kind of like when you work in a hospital and we hear alarms all the time where you're in the hospital, you hear the alarm, you're like, my word, can somebody just go turn off that alarm? But you can come out, the nursing staff all are not paying attention to the alarm because they've gotten so used to the alarms. Same thing with our phones. You can get so used to the, your phone going off that it going off doesn't really mean you're like, eh, I'll look at that later. <laughs> and then you miss something. So I always say it's great if you can get, and I'm not talking fancy planners. I'm not a big fan of fancy planners. I mean, I think they're cute, but functionally wise, they don't work well, especially for CRCI patients because they're too overwhelming. But if you can get a simple planner or a simple calendar that just has a month overview, and maybe the next pages have an individual, like each day where you can write down information from the day, that is a much, much better way for CRCI patients to keep up with information. Number one, it is all in one location. You've got your calendar there where you can put all your appointments, but then you have the next page where you can have notes from those appointments. You can have notes of things that you think of in the middle of the day. Like how many of you are driving down the road and you're like, oh, I gotta do that, right? And so it allows you to have a place to dump all that information, but in one location. What I find with my patients with CRCI is that like post-it notes start to become your friends and you start writing, trying to write down information on random places because you know you need to write it down. The problem with that is that post-it note gets lost or the piece of random piece of paper gets thrown away or you've got post-it notes everywhere and they're too overwhelming and you can't keep up with information. So by having a single planner that has the ability for you to put all your appointments in plus notes from those appointments, everything is in one location. It's much easier to keep up with. And honestly, because your brain is having to write the information, it's not only that you saw the information, but you actually wrote it, had to think about it, placed it in there, and then continue to see it on a daily basis. I always tell people when you wake up the first thing in the morning, you need to check the planner. Before you go to bed at night, you need to check the planner. So that, that way, when you're going to bed at night, you're like, oh, oh, yes, I do have that dentist appointment at 9 a.m. I need to set my alarm a little earlier. But when you wake up in the morning, you get an idea of what your day looks like as well. I find that my patients who use the paper pencil planner to do this, do far better than my patients who are like, oh, I've got a calendar I keep on the wall at the house. Well, that calendar doesn't go with you. So you might start off the day remembering where you're headed, but if you don't have it with you, you might forget halfway through the day. Um, so that's usually a general help as I try to tell people, you wanna make things visual. So going on that idea of visual, you can have the paper, pencil calendar, or planner that you take with you, medications. Put your medications in a location where you can see them, okay? So your morning medications right there beside, you know, your breakfast plate, where you, wherever you eat black breakfast normally, that's a fantastic place to put it. If you have nighttime medications, I, I find that 90% of my patients always remember their morning meds, always. They get up, they eat breakfast, they have a routine. The meds they miss are the middle of the day meds and the nighttime meds. And it's because middle of the day you get distracted. And if you come to CTCA, you're here all day and you've got a kajillion appointments and you don't like, you know, you're just going from one appointment to the next. And so I tell people for middle of the day and for nighttime, for middle of the day, if you're going to be leaving your house and you know you're going to be going in the middle of the day and you're not going to be there to take that medication, you need to have a travel pill box. And that travel pill box needs to be a part of, okay, I'm leaving for today. Let me put all my pills with me. Let me take that pill box with me and, you know, put it in your purse, pocket, whatever. So that, that way is there with you to take wherever you are. And then nighttime meds, 
what usually happens is people fall asleep before they take the nighttime meds. And so, and it's because their nighttime meds may be on the kitchen counter still, or they're on a bathroom counter. So I tell people, if you put your nighttime meds by your bed, at least you have the most likelihood of taking them because you fall asleep in the chair, you get up, you head to your, you know, head to your bed and there's your nighttime meds. You're like, oh yeah, I've got to take those. Um, so just making things visual. I tell people in terms of like keys, if you lose your keys, you lose your glasses a lot. Um, I've always recommended getting a basket that you can put near your back door. So I tell people, you can make it decorative. It can make it look like it's part of your kitchen. If your kitchen's where you walk in from, you know, in the back door into the kitchen, have a basket there where you put everything that you need to take with you in the basket. So like I, things I have to have with me when I leave, my cell phone, my keys, right? My purse, I, my sunglasses preferably. So I get home and I put those items in my basket. I put my keys there. I put my cell phone there. I have this near charger so I can I have a cell phone charger in my basket so that way I can plug it in and charge it. Put my sunglasses there and I put my purse underneath the basket, okay? You can do this with anything. I have a five-year-old, okay? I learned a long time ago in motherhood that shoes are the things that a child cannot keep up with. The shoes get taken off and they're everywhere. I got one upstairs, one downstairs. I was like, you know what? I bet I could teach this strategy to my child. So when my child was two and a half, I started teaching that shoes go by the back door. I don't care where you are when you're in the house. If you take off your shoes, they have to go by the back door. So now my five-year-old, if it's time to leave, we know his shoes are by the back door. We don't have to go hunting for the shoes because I've taught him that's the place where they go, right? If you have a basket or somewhere we're a place where all these items I need when I leave, you put them there when you get in. So that way they're there. Um, I had a patient, the guy I was mentioning, who always was forgetting his lunch and driving his wife insane. She got a basket. They put the keys there. They put the wallet there, every the sunglasses. And then she started packing and putting his lunch in the basket. And I think one of the most excited things he see was is he came in and he was like 15 days of work when I haven't left a sandwich at home. And she was like, I cannot tell you how exciting that is for me. And while it sounds crazy, it was a simple thing that was causing conflict between the two of them. And so a simple way to fix it, just put it where you can always see it, go out the door, you grab your sandwich and you're ready to go. So tell people, just try to make things visual. If you need to remember, they need to be visual. Going with that, families love to call and tell you a pile of information on the phone. You just politely tell them, and I so enjoyed this conversation. I want to be able to remember that barbecue that we're having next week. So can you just text me the, the, what event we're going to and what time it's going to be at and what day it's going to be on? Because a text message is something you have read and seen. It is much easier for you to remember than the conversation that you had that may have lasted an hour. And it's difficult to keep up with all that information. Okay. So always important to keep things visual. My other tip that I'm going to give you today before we get to the questions is cognitive stimulation. It is really, really, really important that you, can, you remain cognitively stimulated. Okay. Patients um, don't realize how much they may lose cognitive stimulation during the course of treatment, but I see it day in and day out. People aren't able to work you know, during treatment. And so if work provides lots of cognitive stimulation or secondly, maybe you were already retired prior to your diagnosis, okay? Or you're gonna have to be retired because of your diagnosis. The hobbies that you were doing prior to cancer, you know, your whole life, all the events you had, those change with treatment, right? The focus changes. You end up spending more time with us here at CTCA and not feeling so great. And so the things that you've always been passionate about sometimes can take a back burner. Unfortunately, what happens is that you start sleeping more, resting more, and then the cognitive stimulation just kind of decreases. And that old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it, actually exists, especially when it comes to brain functioning. I've seen it firsthand, okay? If you can stay cognitively stimulated, and that looks different for everybody. It doesn't have to be reading because 90% of my patients look at me and go, you know, I never like to read. I don't want to read. I go, okay, fine. Let's see what you do like to do. Um, I had a patient recently last week, the caregiver was like, no, they're not willing to do puzzles. No, they don't want to do games. No, they never like to read. I was like, okay, what's something that 
they like to do and don't actually argue with you about and the wife because the patient was a male was like the wife goes you know what he doesn't really mind going to the grocery store for me he actually likes going to the grocery store she goes but I can't give you more than three items and I said okay so how many days a week do you send in the grocery store she goes eh, you know once every other week I said oh no 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 if he doesn't mind going to the grocery store that's fantastic cognitive stimulation you're giving him three to four items for him to go get he's got to figure out where that is in the grocery store He's got to maneuver around folks. He's got to interact with people. He's got to make sure he's paying for it, getting the receipt, bringing it home, putting it up for you. I was like, that's excellent cognitive stimulation. He needs to be going multiple days a week. And she was like, oh, well, I hadn't thought of that. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. That's keeping him stimulated. So I always tell people, you got to find something you enjoy. And that's what you may do more of. It doesn't have to be game. Like, it doesn't have to be puzzles. Though those are great if you enjoy puzzles. If you enjoy games, there's really fantastic apps that they have on the smartphones now for cognitive stimulation. I'm a big fan of Elevate, E-L-E-V-A-T-E. -E. That's a fantastic one. It's free. You can choose the free version. You don't have to pay for it. I love that one. Um, Words with friends is great, but you can do that with family members. Um, you know, there's lots of apps that are out there for cognitive stimulation if you enjoy that but if you don't enjoy it there's no need to put it on your phone or even try it because you're not going to do it so you have to find something that you enjoy if it you enjoy putting together model airplanes put together a model airplane that's fantastic cognitive stimulation if you like to garden that's great if you like to cook planning meals hosting those that takes a lot of cognitive stimulation and function to actually perform those tasks so i always encourage people it's really important that you just try to stay cognitively stimulated and I tell people, you know, give me 15 to 30 minutes of your Facebook time or your online reading time and let's substitute it with something that can be cognitively stimulating um, as well. I had one patient, he was like, listen, I don't like to read. I don't like to do games. I was like, but you really love football. He's like, oh yeah, I do really love football. I was like, so how many articles a week do you think you read about football? And he's like, I mean, I do like to read football articles, but I probably only read one a week. And I was like, huh, if I give you a website that has a lot of in-depth college football information with you reading, he's like, oh yeah. And that was it. All I had to do was give him a website. He was reading five to seven articles a day. He could tell you anything about any of the SEC football teams. And that's cognitive stimulation. So it's really just important that we're keeping your brain going. So I think those would be my two biggest tips for you today is keep things visual where you can see it because out of sight, out of mind, truly. And number two, try to figure out, okay, what do I enjoy doing? What can I do more of that? So that way you keep your brain cognitively stimulated. So I want to make sure